welcome back and happy new year. Thank you so much for joining me throughout the holiday season. And what better way to ring in the new year than by writing some code for my 40 year old business mini computer here. Now, uh, throughout the holiday season, uh, a lot of new people have joined the channel, in which case, uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, but you may have joined the channel through uh, maybe the 555 timer video or the PDP-11, and you may not be familiar with the Centurion. Well, the Centurion is a mainstay of the channel, and we have about uh, 24, 25 episodes of backstory on it. So if you want to know more about it, there is a ton of uh, material for you to watch to catch up, but I'll give you a quick cliff notes, so that way, as we go through today's episode, you kind of have an idea of what we're working on. And uh, Centurion was a local company here in Texas that built mini computers from about 1971, 1972, all the way up to about 19. 84. Uh, this particular machine though is a hodgepodge of parts from uh, the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, most notably the CPUs from about 1983 and our main hard drive here is from about 1978. So quick rundown of the specs, the CPU is an 8-bit CPU uh, that runs at 5 megahertz. There is 256k of RAM in the machine and our hard drive here gives us 10 megabytes of storage. Five of that is fixed, five of that is removable, so we can change it out with a different five megabytes. Now, some of those specs sound pretty awesome, notably the drive, uh, and some of them sound really not that exciting. Uh, most notably the CPU, an 8-bit CPU running at five megahertz is really nothing to write home about in 1983, because that seems just about on par with a 6502 or a Z80. And well, it has a ton of memory, right? 256K of RAM, but only 6K of that is available to a user for their program. So we've got this huge amount of memory and uh, only one user can use 6K. So it seems like a lot of it's going to waste and it seems like the CPU is a little maybe underpowered. Uh, but we're looking at it from the perspective of a single user. This machine is all about two things. One is mass storage, being able to storage, store a huge amount of data, and the second is multi-user capability. This machine can support, I believe, up to 32 simultaneous users. Personally, I only have three MUX cards, so I could only extend it up to uh, 12 users max, and 12 users it would be able to go through with absolutely no problems at all, because the CPU is designed around the idea of multi-users. Uh, the CPU itself is a uh, AM2901 based card. The AM2901 is a four bit bit slice ALU. It has eight ROMs on it that give a 64 bit micro word for all of the microcode on it. And it has a pretty impressive instruction set. Not only that, all of the CPU registers are duplicated across 16 interrupt levels. So the CPU can bounce back and forth between different interrupt levels, depending on what requests are coming in from users. Uh, now, what about that RAM? It only has 6K per user. Well, if we think about 32 simultaneous users, well, six times 32 is, uh, I think, 192. Uh, and then we have, I think, about 32K of RAM that the operating system uses, and then other stuff happens in there. So if you look at it from the perspective of a multi-user machine, the thing is unbelievably good. It's up there swinging with the best of them. Now I said it does two things. It's multi-user capability and mass storage. The CDC Hawk drive that we're using in here today is a, a 10 megabyte drive and it's from about 1978. So it's actually a little old for the machine. A more period correct drive would be the Phoenix drive. It has, I believe, 80 megabytes of fixed storage and 16 megabytes of removable storage for a total of 96 megabytes. Not only that, the CMD controller for it can support multiple Phoenix drives. So uh, I think we did some figuring out if you had 
all of the money in the world and you just plugged everything in, you could spec this thing out to like 500 plus megabytes in the early 80s. That is a huge amount of storage. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what uh, this Centurion mini computer is. I absolutely adore this machine. But one thing that I have never done with it is write code for it. The Centurion OS is a completely proprietary custom operating system. As a matter of fact, the way that the Centurion handles data is really unique because it was based around an old tape drive. So it has uh, 400 bytes per sector, 16 sectors per track, so on and so forth. So the operating system is completely unique, which means that the built-in programming language, CPL or Centurion programming language, is also completely unique unique. And uh, well, what I want to do today is I want to get familiar with how to write code for this machine. Maybe we can figure out some pretty interesting things. Now, writing code for a uh, computer that has pretty much no documentation available for it is pretty difficult, but it was made a lot easier with the help of uh, two people. Um, Jeff, who supplied me with a CPU6 programmer's manual. Jeff used to work at Centurion back in the day, and uh, he kind of took the CPU6 programmer's manual, put it in his jacket pocket, and took it with him when he left. He's been holding on to it for like 40 years, uh, and recently he came across the channel and he said, you know what, you've got the real hardware, maybe you can put this to good use. He sent me the manual and it has been absolutely indispensable. It has been just a wonderful, amazing resource. So Jeff, thank you so much for that. One more person who's done a ton of work with figuring out how to program this is Rin14500. Some of you may recognize his name because he wrote the emulator for the vacuum tube computer that I'm building. And uh, he wrote that emulator with the ultimate goal of getting it to run on the Centurion. So over the past few days, we've been working very closely together, trying to figure out more about CPL, and Rin has been an absolute legend and has pretty much cracked it. We know a ton about CPL now. He's been digging through the uh, programmer's manual and he's been teaching me as well. And uh, I think we have something pretty interesting uh, lined up for this. Now, the easiest program to write is print Hello World, or Hello World if you're boring. Hello World is better. That's the easiest type of program to write. But that's also kind of boring and doesn't really exercise our programming chops. So I'm going to do something a little more difficult. I want to do actual math today. Uh, and there's a great website called projectoiler.net, I think, and they have a collection of uh, very difficult math problems that pretty much require programming to do. Now, there's some mad lads out there that are doing it by hand, uh, but <laughs> I'm not that smart, so I'm going to use uh, smart rocks to do the uh, hard number crunching for me. And uh, well, I think what we want to do today is write a program that answers Project Euler's question number one. Uh, find the sum of all multiples of three or five below 1,000. So let's uh, kick the power on, spin the old Hawk drive up, get into the operating system, and uh, let's start writing some code for this thing. All right, I've got the master switch on for the Centurion, which means that the cooling fans for the uh, Hawk drive are on. That's kind of that low sound that we're hearing in the background. I'm going to turn the main computer on, but I, I don't actually have a key for it. So I'm just gonna use a uh, wave rake with a uh, tensioner here. So we'll put a little bit of tension in the keyhole, run our wave rake through, and we picked it just like that. So we'll turn the power on. And uh, the CRT here should be warming up. Yeah, there we go. We've got a uh, massive collection of dots and a blinking cursor. Uh, I'll go ahead and reset the system here so we get D equals. So now we're ready to boot into the operating system, but uh, we gotta actually spin the Hawk drive up for that. So I'm gonna push the start stop button on the front of the Hawk drive here. It's gonna start spinning up the platters. It takes about uh, 50 seconds for it to get fully up to speed, stabilized, and then float the heads. Um, now I heard the Hawk Drive uh, finally load the heads, so we're ready to boot into the operating system. I'm gonna type H1 up here. It does uh, three quick 
uh, RTZs, and then it goes out and it starts reading the uh, Whipple, finds uh, at load, and then loads us into the operating system here. We'll go ahead and hit enter. We'll put the date as um, 08-2384. The time, we'll just set it to noon. We'll hit enter. And as soon as it says CRT0 ready, we are fully in the operating system and we're ready to get started. All right, there we go, CRT0 ready. We'll type .sta just to make sure that we're working correctly. And yeah, there we go. We can get some uh, system information up here. There's our uh, 256K of RAM. Uh, now, anytime we're gonna write code, we need to do it in some kind of development environment. We don't have any fancy IDE, but really all you actually need is a text editor. And the Centurion has a built-in text editor called Compose. So we'll type S.KOM. P O Z, hit enter. Uh, there we go, text composition system. Input file name, uh, that's gonna be uh, ZPE01. Now it's very important that it starts with the letter Z. Uh, it has to for the way that the compiler works and we'll deal with that when we get to it later. We're not gonna put it in any folder, so we're just gonna hit enter there. Uh, the disk number, we'll go ahead and store it on the removable platter, so that would be disk uh, zero here. So we'll hit um, enter on that. And now we're on the uh, main menu, <laughs> if you want to call it a menu, uh, for the Compose system here. Now Compose is a very confusing text editor. It's because it required a complete paradigm shift in the way that I thought about text editors, because this text editor was written in the era of having tape for your storage device back in the really early 70s. So it requires a very strong mental image of what your program is going to look like. Uh, but let's start writing code. And in order to do that, we wanna jump into edit mode. So we're gonna press the letter K. Now it gives me an option to put an uh, argument in here, and this can be our uh, end statement. But I don't wanna do that. I'm just gonna hit enter here because I can exit out at any time using control J. So we're just gonna hit enter and now we're ready to start typing our code. So we're going to start by just giving our uh, program a title. So we'll call it title uh, and then we'll say uh, project Euler on a Centurion. And uh, there we go, we wrote our first line of code. Yay, but there's a lot more, more complex things that we gotta do. So we'll start with uh, system here and then we'll do the name of our file, zpe01. Uh, and then we'll say that it is main comma exp equals d comma ll equals 80. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of interesting things going on here. Main is essentially telling us that this is the main part of the program. This is not a subroutine. Uh, exp is talking about um, compatibility. So uh, backwards compatibility with older CPUs. LL is line length, so that's going to be um, 80 lines. Uh, so I think that that's our 80 columns for our display up there. Um, so the next line that we're going to type is file CRT colon, uh, and then sysipt comma class equals zero comma seq. So this creates a file control block and it maps that file control block to the CRT and then sets it up for uh, sequential use. Um, so then we'll go ahead and hit enter on that one and we'll start actually writing real code now. Um, and we'll start by declaring a, a format and we'll call it uh, FLIN for um, full line and we'll set it to C80. Um, and so anytime we print something to the CRT, we have to tell it what format we want to print it in. And so in this case, we're telling it that uh, we want to print in a format of characters, so strings, and we have a limit of 80 columns. Uh, so we'll hit enter on that, and then we'll do format again, and we'll name this one fans, and uh, we're gonna set that one to um, N9. Uh, so again, this is another format from when we write something to the CRT here, but it's actually going to be integers. It's gonna be digits now, and we want to have uh, nine characters set aside for that. Um, so we'll hit enter on that. Now let's start declaring some uh, variables. So we're gonna do set, and then we're gonna do cnt uh, colon zero. 
So we use set when we want to uh, declare an integer and initialize it. So in this case, we're declaring C and T, which is short for count, uh, and we're initializing it to zero. Now there are four more uh, integers that I want to declare here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and type set uh, OPA to zero. OPA obviously stands for the Outer Planets Alliance. Um, so you know we'll, we'll have to deal with them a little later. Uh, and then we'll do set A, is A and S for our answer. We'll declare it at zero. Um, and then finally we'll do set PRO for progress to zero as well. And next I want to declare a string and we're going to set this string to uh, be called a WAT for weight. Uh, and we're going to make it just one character long. And so that's what the parentheses after the name of the string that we're declaring is. It's telling us how long that string is. Now we need to type in a few more housekeeping things before we can get into the real meat and potatoes. So we're going to start with uh, entry point here. Uh, and we're going to say entry point CRT. And uh, what this does is it defines the symbols that are going to be needed by other libraries. This is some internal wizardry that's going on. Uh, I just know that we need to have it and that's why it's there. Um, and then we'll do entry and this is telling us this is the start of the real proper code from here. Uh, and then we'll do open IO CRT. And this is uh, opening that CRT file for input and output so we can interact with the user. Um, once we've finished all that, let's start actually writing stuff to the, the terminal. So we'll start with uh, WRITE for write. Um, and then we're going to tell it that we're writing to the CRT and we want to have that uh, format be a full line. Um, and then uh, we're going to write eject. <laughs> and I'm not putting it in quotes because eject is actually a term that we can use to eject the current sheet of paper. We have to think about this not as a data terminal, but as a teletype. So eject ejects the current sheet of paper and loads up a new sheet of paper, uh, which means on a uh, terminal like this, it clears the screen. So that's how we clear the screen. We eject the current sheet of paper. So next, let's write out the uh, actual problem that we're doing. Uh, Project Euler, we're going to write the full, the, the full description of the problem so that way the user, when they run this program, they can see what it is that the program is actually doing. All right, now we're going to start the actual program and we're going to do that by writing a loop. So we're going to start with loop. Uh, and then we want to continue looping while, um, and then C and T is our uh, integer for count. Um, and then we're going to say C and T period L E period nine, nine, nine. Um, and so this is going to loop while count is less than or equal to 999. To make our loop look a little easier here, I'm just going to put two spaces at the beginning here. Um, and then we're going to say OPA equals uh, and then mod and then CNT comma three. All right. So now we're setting the uh, variable OPA to equal the modulus of the division of CNT and three. And the modulus is just the remainder. So the computer will divide CNT by three and put the remainder of that division into OPA. And then we'll say if uh, parentheses OPA dot EQ dot zero do. All right, so now we're doing a if then statement. So if OPA is equal to zero, do the following. Uh, and then we'll do ANS equal ANS plus CNT. So answer equals answer plus count. So we'll hit enter on that, do two spaces, end do. Uh, so that shores up our first part of the if then statement and then we'll do else do. Um, so now we're doing an if then else statement and it's important that there is an end do before the else do otherwise CPL gets confused uh, and then we'll say OPA equals mod uh, CNT comma five. Uh, and now we're checking to see if the remainder of a division by five is equal to zero. Uh, and then we'll do if OPA dot EQ dot zero. Uh, and then we'll do ANS equals ANS plus CNT. 
Um, and so now you can see that we wrote an if statement that doesn't have the do on it because we kept it all on one line. Uh, so we'll go ahead and hit enter on that. One, two, three, and then we'll do end do. That's shoring up our else do. So our else do and our end do are now linked. So that's how you can make sure that the code is grouped together correctly. And then um, I want to have a progress bar or something because this is a pretty intensive piece of code. So I want something to let the user know that it hasn't locked up. Also, we have to do something. We have to make a service call of some type. Otherwise, there is a one second watchdog timer that will error the program out. So we're gonna say uh, OPA equals uh, mod um, CNT 10. So every time that our count is uh, a divisible by 10, we're going to actually execute something here. So we'll go if opa.eq.0 uh, do, and then we're gonna do a string of if statements here. It's not pretty, but it'll get the job done. So I'm just gonna punch them in right quick, and I think you'll get an idea of what our progress bar is actually gonna look like. Um, now, assigning strings is a little interesting. So we need to put the uh, string name Watt in single parentheses, um, and then we need to assign it in such a way that, um, well, if we're assigning it with a variable, with a literal, or with a mixed, they all get assigned differently. We're assigning it with a literal. So we have single quotes, and then double quotes, and then our literal is in the center. Um, so the next uh, thing that we wanna do is we wanna print that uh, status out. So we're going to type in C-U-R-S, uh, and then we're gonna do uh, CRT comma one comma W-A-T. And what this does is it's an instruction that tells us where to put the cursor and then what to print at that cursor position. So we're moving the cursor back to position one, and then we're printing the string Watt at that position. Uh, next, we gotta do a little bit of cleanup to make sure that we cycle around properly. Uh, so we'll do if pro.le.2 uh, uh, incr pro. But when we get to three, we actually want to reset it. Uh, so we'll hit enter on that one, and then we'll say else pro equals zero. Now we're starting to come up to finishing out our program. So we have an if do, so if OPA EQ zero equals do, do, do all that. So we need to end that. So we gotta do END do, so we end do. That ends our do that we've been working on up to there. Um, next, we want to increment count. So our count is our number that's going from zero all the way up to 999. We're gonna increment it. And then finally, we end our loop. So there we go, that's the end of our loop. We go all the way back up to the top and run all of that again. Once the loop has fully run, we need to print the answer to the CRT so we know what the answer actually is. So we're going to uh, write to the CRT and we're gonna do FLIN for full line and we're just gonna print a blank line. So nothing, just do two uh, single quotes here for nothing. Um, and then we're gonna do write in uh, and then again, we're gonna say CRT, F-L-I-N, and then we're gonna say the answer, if I could spell it right, the answer is uh, colon, single quotes. Um, all right, so you notice that there was an N at the end of right. That N stands for no new line. So we write the answer is to the screen, but we do not use a new line so that the next thing that we write is going to be after that. And the next thing that we want to write is the actual answer. So we'll do write CRT F-L-I-N and then A-N-S. And there we go. We've got our answer on the screen. That's the end of our program. So let's uh, close up some things here. So we're going to go close CRT. That closes the CRT for input output. Uh, we're going to do stop zero. Uh, this returns control back to the operating system. And then we'll do end to mark the end of our program. There we go. We just wrote our full program. So I'll go ahead and hit enter and it's time to save it. Now in order to save it, I gotta get back to the main menu. So I'm gonna hit Control J. That gets us back to the main menu prompt here. And then I wanna hit X to save our program. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Records read zero, records written 
46. So now that we've written our program and we've saved it, let's go ahead and quit out of Compose by pressing Q here. It says uh, end Compose, shows me some information about input output. Now we're ready to check it. So let's double check it. We'll do s.crt space zpe01, uh, and then we'll hit space zero to let us know that the, the file's on drive zero there. It's not in any library. So there we go. Now we're taking a look at what our actual program looks like. I think we actually did type it in all correctly though. Let's compile this. And we're gonna compile it by doing p.cpl. We're gonna tell it that we wanna compile PE01. Notice I left off the Z, and that's because the compiler automatically puts the Z in place. That file is gonna be on drive zero. We want the display to be CRT zero, and we don't have any extra arguments, so I'm gonna put X in there. Let's go ahead and hit enter. Uh, there is no library, and we're gonna start compiling. We'll see if it makes it actually all the way through here. Ooh, we got some errors there. All right, we had some compile errors there, and I think I figured out what went wrong. They were all on these uh, if progress equals zero statements, um, and I have a single quote, then double quote, and I think I've got that backward. It's supposed to be a double quote, then single quote, uh, with the literal in the middle. Um, so. Let's see if we can figure out how to do some editing on Compose here. So let's make sure that we're at the top, first of all. Uh, now I wanna get down to if pro.eq.0, then what, whatever. So let's do find, uh, yes, um, and we wanna find the line before that. Uh, OPA equals mod cnt comma 10. So I'll hit that, looks like we found it. Um, now that's not the line that we wanna start editing from. So we'll hit in for next line. So now we need to start fixing things. So I'm gonna hit K to edit. Uh, we'll hit enter on that. And then I'll type in our four new lines here with the uh, appropriate uh, switching of the uh, uh, parentheses or the quotation marks there. Okay, so I've got the new lines typed out, but they're just inserted. We didn't actually erase the old lines. And this is where we have to kind of change our thinking. We've just inserted something in the middle of the tape. So now we have to skip past the part that we want to er erase or delete. Uh, so I'm gonna hit Control J to uh, exit us back out to the uh, main menu here. Um, and then I'm gonna search again, F find, yes. Uh, and we want to find the very next uh, line that we want to start writing from. And that's going to be our curs line. C-U-R-S, uh, C-R-T, uh, comma, one, comma, W-A-T. Um, so we find that line. Okay, so we did find that line. Uh, and next, we want to make sure that we run the tape all the way to the end. Um, so we're going to do P all the way down to the... Uh, uh, line that's called stop zero. Yeah, so it displayed all the way down to that. We'll hit end to make sure that we get end in place. Now we're at the end of the uh, the, the thing here, so we'll rewrite it. Uh, so it said records read 46, records written 18. I don't know if that's good news or bad news. <laughs> so we'll quit out of compose here. Uh, and let's take a look at our file again. We'll do s.crtzpe01 on zero. Hit enter. Um, yeah, nope, that's bad news. We lost everything from the top. Ah, <laughs> oh, geez. All right, that's, uh, boy, I, I hate Compose. It's. It's a terrible text editor. Uh, also, I just haven't figured out how to use it correctly just yet. Editing is insanely difficult. But uh, I went through and I rewrote the entire program from scratch. I think it's okay. Let's try compiling it again. Uh, we'll do p.cpl uh, pe01 uh, on zero for crt0 with no arguments. Hit enter, no library. Uh, come on, don't give me any errors. Oh, that's good. I don't think we had any uh, compile errors. Oh, 
Oh, <laughs> we got a new error. All right. Uh, it says S et SCRE0 on one, not found. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cancel out of this. Uh, I think we just need to make that file. So we'll do dot NEW for new at SCRE0 on one uh, executable one track. Uh, enter. There we go. One more time. P.CPL. Uh, PE010 CRT0X. I hope this works. Okay. Come on. Come on, baby. You can make it. Uh, okay, we've, <laughs> we've definitely made it uh, far. Yeah, we definitely made it a lot further now. That's all of my code. Uh, now, CPL. Uh, essentially converts one line to, to assembly. It all breaks down directly into assembly, and that's what we're seeing here. It's breaking down my code directly into assembly. Um, it's looking good so far. I don't think we have any errors at all. It's creating a new file called XPE01. That's our executable. So when ultimately we get to where we want to run that, that's what we're going to run. It compiled, we have an executable. Whether that executable works or not, I don't know. So we'll do um, dot run uh, XPE01 on one. Uh, please work. File not found. Oh, my file's on zero. What am I doing? Dot, dot run XPE01 on zero. Now let's go. There we go, it's running. Please tell me it didn't hang. The answer is no, so close. <laughs> I'm gonna need a minute. Oh, Jesus. All right, I think I found the error when I was printing the answer uh, I was using the format FLIN, which is a format for characters, for strings, but I was telling it to print an integer. So I needed to change that format uh, back over to FANS. I've recompiled. I think it'll work now. So again, we'll do uh, dot run XPE01 on zero. We'll hit enter. That's good news. Our little progress bar is going. Uh, whew, boy, it sure takes a long time. The answer is 233,168. That is the correct answer. We did it. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Who would have thought that programming in CPL would have been so difficult? Uh, and uh, I think a lot of that difficulty stems from the fact that the editor is such a pain to use. Uh, but Rin has been working on a solution for that, and we're going to get into that into the next episode. Uh, now, before, <laughs> before I just call it quits here and go and sit down, uh, I do want to address the fact that it took a long time to uh, get the answer. The majority of the time is writing that little spinning circle, that little spinning progress bar that we have. That takes up a huge amount of effort. Rin actually wrote a program to test how much time that takes compared to just doing a regular service call that doesn't print anything to the screen. And the difference was like 10 milliseconds versus one millisecond. Uh, so if we didn't have that cool little spinning uh, progress bar, it probably would have been 10 times as fast to get the answer. But the spinning progress bar sure looks cool. Uh, so there you go. We, we managed to program it. Uh, it's. It was not easy. It was very difficult. Uh, I'll put a link below to copies of this code plus all of the, the neat things that Rin has written as well that are available, like the uh, watchdog timer service call code and stuff like that. Uh, also, I'll put a link below to the wonderful CPU6 programmer's manual that Jeff supplied. Um, so if you are curious and you want to start learning how to program in CPL, you absolutely can. Mesaka has a wonderful emulator that emulates the actual microcode of the CPU6. It's as close to accurate as you can get without having the real hardware. 
and it's web-based. You can just go click on the link and start running it. Now you're gonna need the operating system uh, disk image and I can't distribute that freely. Uh, but if you are really, really keen on learning how to program for this machine, I uh, think it's important to get more people involved in this project. So there's going to be a link below to the Discord. Jump on the Discord chat server, shoot me a message, and we'll figure out how to get you a copy of the operating system image so you can start writing new code for a 40-year-old mini computer, if that's something that you're into. Well, I hope that you enjoyed watching me bang my head against the wall trying to program this machine. In the end, we got there and I couldn't be happier with the result, <laughs> even though the, the journey was painful. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode. <sighs>